let's uh, let's get started with uh, Patty Claire. I don't need to introduce her to Kimberly and Larry because they know her very well. Good morning, everyone. Um, what I'm about to tell you is not for the faint of heart, so if you're queasy, this isn't your show. Um, in 1980, I testified on this campus at the uh, former law school uh, before a U.S. EPA administrative law judge. On, um, I was interrogated for four hours by a Dow Chemical uh, lawyer about what had happened in 1976 and 1977 when 245T was sprayed on me and my family. Uh, living in, uh, on the South Umpqua River. Uh, it was an unannounced spring, and so we were unprepared, and we were exposed. Uh, and we had health problems, and uh, so I've written a declaration about it in, in, in the uh, cancellation proceedings for 245T, and that's how I ended up here. Uh, EPA was investigating whether it should ban 245T, um, one of the most toxic pesticides that's ever been made, and the bad actor ingredient of Agent Orange, um, which is used extensively as a weapon of war in Vietnam. Uh, stories have got, begun to emerge from Vietnam about a host of illnesses, including rampant cancers and birth defects, that Vietnam medical authorities attributed to the uh, supersaturation of that nation. And, you know, 245T. It was used to defoliate trees so they could see the path that the Vietcong were using. Returning American vets displayed a lot of symptoms, but first and um, most obviously was a skin condition called chloroacne, which is a really serious symptom. Uh, that, uh, as uh, studies begin, it was attributed to a contaminant of 245T called dioxin. Um, EPA canceled the registration of 245T 18 months after I testified, but health problems continued to plague my family, my children for years. Um, and as time went by, birth defects among the children and grandchildren of Vietnam vets became um, uh, displayed. And many Vietnam vets had mental conditions that rendered them incapable of, of handling normal life. Um, and that's probably attributable also to 245D and the dioxin that contaminated it, primarily the dioxin. So 245T is one of a family of chemical products that were developed when chemical engineers wanted to find ways to use a waste product called car uh, coal tar that is the waste of a uh, manufacturer of coke, which is a refined coal product that um, is used to superheat and, and manufacture steel. Um, they created a lot of interesting products um, at that time, and this is a very early in the 20th century, even before World War I, that this began in Europe. And uh, so, one of the chemicals they developed at that time, one of the very earliest, was a, um, a chemical called pentachlorophenol. They knew this stuff was really toxic right away. And they used it and discovered that what it was most efficient at was protecting wood from fungus and insects, bacteria, anything else that might degrade wood. It was so toxic that no organism could live in the wood uh, that had been saturated with this chemical. So this wonderfully effective chemical was soon marketed throughout the developed world and by 1927 was registered formally for use in the United States. Penta was very popular. It was used in products such as toothpaste, plaster, drywall compound, house paint, cutting oil, and just all kinds of things, uh, commercial and household products. But Penta sales didn't really take off until the early 50s when sawmills throughout the nation, and particularly in the Northwest, found that in competing for market share, if they didn't have penta uh, on saturated into the wood they were selling, they just, it just wasn't desirable. People expected to have um, wood that was treated 
Um, but gradually, its use has declined um, until the mid-80s when the sawmills that were using Pento, the last of them, were shut down because the, the Pento's toxic qualities, particularly dioxin, were by that time so undeniably and universally recognized that regulatory agencies had to take action. Uh, Penta is contaminated with several very toxic chemicals, but the most outstanding of these is 2378-TCDD. This is the most toxic of the dioxins, uh, and it's also present in 245-T, and it's the most toxic chemical ever created by humans other than the products of radiation. Uh, dioxin is created when heat is applied to the chemicals during manufacture, and it's an accidental but unavoidable consequence of the process. The term dioxins is commonly used to refer to a family of toxic chemicals that we have displayed here on the screen. Uh, they all share a similar chemical structure and a common mechanism of toxic action. This family includes seven of the polychlorinated dibenzodioxins, including 2378-TCDD, and 10 of the polychlorinated dibenzofurans, all of which are components, albeit unintended components, of pentachlorophenol. So pentachlorophenol itself and several of its other contaminants are extremely toxic and cancer-causing chemicals. The focus of the greatest concern of pentachlorophenol is the dioxins. Dioxins occur as a complex mixture in the environment and in food. To assess the potential risk of the whole mixture, the concept of toxic equivalence has been applied to this group of contaminants. This is all kind of complicated, but the TCDD is the most toxic member and is used as a reference compound. All the other dioxins in the chemicals in this list and the related compounds, they're assigned a toxic potency relative to TCDD. So if you have a presence of the group, the way you arrive at the end number of the amount that you have is by examining the relative merit of each one and then basically adding them up. Um, these are referred to as toxic equivalency factors, or TEFs. TEF values have been established by the World Health Organization for humans, mammals, birds, and fish. But there has no level of dioxin exposure has ever been set that is safe. There's never been one found where there's no observable toxic effect of any amount of dioxin. Dioxins are very persistent environmental pollutants. Just how persistent uh, has never been determined. Uh, to date, we have dioxin contamination in burial sites that is never degraded, decades after they were deposited there. So indicating that dioxins don't break down for decades and pro probably for centuries. Um, dioxins also bioaccumulate. They accumulate in fat in animals and humans. And when animals and their products are consumed, the dioxin in the animal that is eaten remains intact and accumulates in the fat of the animal or human that ate it. So the higher in the food chain one goes, the higher the concentration of dioxin. It has been estimated that dioxin leaves the body slowly, with one half of the dioxin still intact 7 to 11 years after it's been ingested. All people have what's called background exposure, and a certain level of dioxins in the body, everyone, uh, leading to what's called the so-called um, body burden. Due to the highly toxic nature of dioxin, it's critical that additional exposures be kept at minimum possible. The most critical endpoints of dioxin toxic toxicity are in the reproduction and development, the immune system, and hormones. The International Agency for Research on Cancer has determined that dioxin is a known human carcinogen at levels that are not unusual for human exposure. Chronic exposure can cause several types of cancer. 
The most sensitive population is the fetus. Dioxin works on the fetus in the hormone environment in which development takes place. When cells begin to differentiate in the womb, when hands are made, fingers, eyes, organs, well, how that progression unfolds is determined by the hormone environment. Dioxin interferes with these hormones, causing deformities that last through a lifetime. Dioxin particularly affects the development of sexual differences. It also interferes with the development of sexual organs, both delaying their development, such as the opening of the vagina, and deforming them, such as in hypospadia, in which the urethra of the male is open in an abnormal place. These deformities can be extremely difficult to repair. Endometriosis is another outcome, outcome of female fetal exposure. As has been recently established, dioxin exposure is also one of the causes of breast cancer. The effects of dioxin are intergenerational. The grandchildren of dioxin-exposed individuals can express adverse health outcomes as a result of dioxin exposure of the earlier generation. <coughs> the body burden of a parent can amplify dioxin's harm to the offspring. This was demonstrated in an experiment in which white, in which female monkeys were exposed to dioxin and produced male offspring who developed uterine tissue and then endometriosis. Probably one of the most insidious effects of dioxin is its effect on dealing with stress. Hyperactivity, attention deficit disorder, inability to calmly focus on problem solving, and inability to deal with stress are all outcomes of exposure to dioxin. In an experiment with pregnant rats, rats one group was given dioxin-laden salmon from Lake Ontario, one was given clean salmon from the Pacific Northwest, and one was given dioxin-free rat chow. Researchers then observed the offspring who appeared normal, but when exposed to stress, the dioxin-exposed uh, litters panicked. This condition did not subside in the lifetime of the animals. Immune suppression due to dioxin exposure is expressed in heightened allergic reaction and reduced ability to ward off disease, which can be linked to the development of cancer and debilitating chronic diseases such as glucose intolerance. Dioxin toxicity extends well into the animal kingdom and has caused untold economic harm. It was likely the main cause of the decline of the lake trout and the destruction of the valuable, valuable lake trout industry in the Great Lakes. Dioxin has been subject to intense international scrutiny for decades. Its toxic effects are firmly established and too numerous to fully recount here. Research continues to unveil the horror of dioxin decades after its study began. The vast international effort to understand dioxin opened up a new field of study called genetic toxicity. We're all the way down to DNA as a result of um, the study of dioxin. Revelations about endocrine disruption began with research into dioxin's effects. Decades ago, governments internationally undertook a systematic effect to ban chemicals and processes that create dioxin and disseminate it. The EPA canceled 245T for this reason, despite the outcry of foresters and agriculturalists who said that they wouldn't be able to manage their crops without the chemical. Um, in EPA's administrative proceeding in which I participated, more than 300 scientists submitted declarations to this effect. Yet production of 245T was terminated, but only after a decade of intense struggle. All of the processes and chemicals that produce dioxin have been systematically halted, all but one. The one dioxin laced chemical left standing is pentachlorophenol, and it is allowed for use in just one process, the treatment of utility poles that dot our landscape in the millions. How did this come about? Well, if you read Politics of Penta, which Bill has put out here, it's a whodunit of the first degree. And it's page turner. And it's kind of, uh, it was written in 1989, but it's completely relevant and fresh today. Um, it's classic, it's hair rating, 
They're raising and it recounts the power wielded by an industrial complex made up of the timber, the chemical, the utility, and the wood treatment industries. All these united and came together to stop EPA from banning this last use of dioxin. Of dioxin contaminated thank you. Thank you. So much of the battle that occurred in the EPA was over whether penta waste would be considered hazardous. And later that extended to the disposal of used telephone poles, which you can purchase and use for landscaping or other projects around your yard. Published in 1989, it's, it's still very fresh. It's, it's very related to things that are going on today and, and things that have extended from all that, what happened then. As recently as 2008, the Environmental Protection Agency decided to re-register pentachlorophenol. They wrote a, a risk assessment, a number of risk assessments, and one of them, and one of them, I'll give you this quote, EPA has calculated that children face 220 times the risk of cancer from exposure to soil contaminated with pentachlorophenol leaching out of utility poles. That was in an early in the draft of um, the risk assessment. However, what they ended up with was... Um, Cheney got to work. <laughs> what they ended up with was that in order to avoid the outcome, which would have prevented the re-registration, they instead determined that children would not play around telephone poles. Um, so they didn't evaluate the risk of children. So I don't know if anyone else in this room has played around telephone poles. I know I did when I was a kid. And um, so we still have pentachlorophenol being used for this. Thank you. Now we get to Fred, who's going to, um, we have been, Fred and I mainly have been doing, spending a lot of money and doing a lot of looking into what the EPA should have been doing but hasn't done, which is actually testing for dioxin around poles and off of poles and finding how it's being dispersed into the environment at what levels, and Fred's going to help enlighten us on this. Um, thank you. Yeah, our, our sampling actually began up in Humboldt County, um, up around Humboldt Bay, um, in conjunction with Californians for Alternatives to Toxics. Actually, this is a map that uh, Patty, in collaboration with EPIC, made that um, shows the locations of known and suspected sources of penta around Humboldt Bay. These are mostly timber mills. They're lumber mills that used uh, penta in large dip tanks or in spray booths. And they were very sloppy with the use of their chemicals and, of course, with the waste management. Uh, depositions of old timber workers showed that they would take 55-gallon drums of the used chemical and dump it out back in, in pits. In fact, one of them, uh, when they were disclosed that, they were, that there was a dump site out there, they built an employee lunchroom over it to hide it. Oh. Um, there were several lawsuits, actually, of the wrongful deaths um, because many of these timber workers have died of rare cancers that are specifically associated with dioxin exposure. So we had started doing some sampling around the bay. Um, in particular, uh, there's a site up at the top of the bay called the Sierra Pacific Industries Mill on the Mad River Slough, and we started sampling around the slough by the outfalls. We brought experts out there and collected samples of mussels and crabs, and we found elevated levels of dioxin building up in the food chain there. That upset another industry in the Bay. There's a very large mariculture operation in the North Bay, and uh, it's said that they produce about 80% of California's oysters in the north part of Humboldt Bay. So they were pretty upset with the news about this dioxin building up in the food chain around the Mad River Slough. They called up Sierra Pacific and said, you better get out there and prove to people that our oysters are clean. Sierra Pacific hired a consultant to go out with the oyster growers. They collected samples from 10 oyster beds and um, found elevated levels of dioxins in each and every oyster bed that they sampled, including levels that were up to four times the level that EPA says humans should not consume. We then, with that data in hand, went to the State Water Resources Control Board and the EPA, and we got Humboldt Bay 
listed as impaired on the 303D list for its dioxin and furan contamination. Um, we have, over the years, brought Clean Water Act and Resource Conservation and Recovery Act claims to get uh, a number of sites, mill sites, cleaned up. Um, we've uh, had mill sites um, cleaned up that are owned by, let's see, Pacific Lumber Company, uh, Sierra Pacific Industries, Simpson Timber Company, uh, Little River Sawmills, and others. Um, and that led us to the next campaign, which was, now these were, these were historic uses. I mean, they, these mills had not used Penta for over 20 years, 30 years actually. Um, yet, the dioxin is still there. we were still finding extremely high levels of dioxin. One of the tricks of the trade, if you're, a, if you're a mill owner, or in this case, regulatory agency, the Regional Water Quality Control Board, would allow the mill owners to look for Penta alone. So when they did sampling, they would uh, look at surface soils and they would collect those soils and they would sample them for Penta. As Patty mentioned, well, Penta has a half-life in the environment, particularly in an aerobic situation, of 14 days to maybe a couple of months. Penta breaks down. But bacteria can't break down dioxin very easily. The dioxins and furans, those congeners, many of them have half-lives that are measured in decades, uh, generations. So you may go out and find non-detect levels of um, uh, penta, yet when you sample for dioxins and furans, you'll find it's low. The regional board was letting them get away without doing the dioxins and furan sampling. Well, we went out and did the sampling, and once we had the samples in hand, they couldn't ignore it, so we were able to get these sites cleaned up. Um, well, we started looking at discharges from utility poles. Uh, I was pretty amazed to find out that there is a huge volume of information that's available that has been um, produced by the industry itself. There's an American Wood Preservers Association. And there's a lot of research going on right down the road here at Oregon State. Um, and mainly what they're, they're looking at is uh, they're looking at how much penta they can get into a pole and how much is released from the pole over the pole's usable lifespan. Um, so that they could figure out, you know, the best ways to treat these poles to make them last the long, get the best bang for their buck. Um, studies show that there are currently about 140 million treated utility poles in the United States. The majority of those are treated with Penta. Um, according to the US EPA, Penta consumption in the United States is on the rise. In 2004, there were approximately 30 million gallon, gallons used in the United States. Uh, nearly all of that has been, was used for utility poles and cross arms. As Patty mentioned, the EPA in the mid-80s banned the use of Penta for all other purposes. Um, so that 30 million gallons is going to utility poles, almost exclusively. Where does it come from? About 9 million pounds a year are imported from Mexico. And the rest of it is manufactured by a company called Vulcan Materials. And they're in Wichita, Kansas. Um, there's, as far as we know, only one manufacturer of Penta left in the United States. But to the contrary, globally, the use of Penta has been severely uh, restricted. I mean, uh, Patty, I think, touched on this, but many countries have banned all uses of Penta. They're not allowing it in utility poles. In fact, there are many, many countries in the, in the world that don't use wood utility poles at all. Um, the European Union has very strict dioxin limits. Uh, they have removed Penta from use entirely. Japan has stopped the use of Penta altogether. And a number of other countries have followed suit. <coughs> So there are numerous studies that show how the penta and dioxin is released into the environment from the poles. Uh, and as I mentioned, they attempt to, to quantify the losses because that's relevant to their treatment standards and their retreatment protocols. So every once in a while, they have to come back and retreat poles. I think Bill might talk about that a little bit in his presentation. Um, 
the studies show that up to 50% of the penta oil mixture that is put in these poles is released within the first 8 to 10 years of the pole's life. Um, it's not rocket science to figure out how that penta oil leaves the pole. We should just explain one, one thing. The penta is dissolved into oil because it doesn't dissolve into water very easily. So they dissolve it into oil and then they force it into the wood. This oil and penta mixture. And so that brown stuff you see on a pole that you think it's creosote, it's really oil infused. It's a penta oil infusion. Um, and so that, that's what you're looking at. Here. What, kind of what kind of oil? What kind of oil? Motor oil? Just a Number nine, um, heavy oil. Petroleum. Yeah. Not yes. bio. Yeah. No. So can you see the shadow of the oil coming out? It's not bio. Sidewalk, that's what it is. Yeah. That's uh, oil. Yeah. The dark in there. What's the word creosote? What, yeah. what is creosote? Creosote is coal tar dissolved in like water, a carrier. And it's um, it also is really toxic. And it's off, often contaminated with dioxin as well. But it's not anywhere near as highly contaminated with dioxin as pentachlorophenol is. It's used as a wood treatment. They use it on railroad ties and things like that. There are poles in the United States that are treated with creosote. Uh, some poles are also treated with copper-based preservatives. Copper chromium the arsenate. Well, they, it, yes. Yeah. That's one of the copper formulations, right? But over 90% of them are treated with pentachlorophenol. Yeah. <coughs> I don't know if you can uh, see the, the oil and these chunks of penta oil at the bottom of this pole. This, this photo was taken uh, right in front of the new Oregonian hotel across the street here on Franklin. Um, what happens is in the summer, the heat draws this penta oil mix out to the surface of the pole. And there it's uh, exposed to rainwater, washes it down the pole, and gravity forces the oils down to the bottom of the pole. Many of them are also, what they say, butt treated. So they're more heavily uh, apply the penta oil to the bottom six to 10 feet of the pole where it's in ground contact. Um, where does it go? Though this, this photo was taken about 20 feet away on Franklin Street. So not only do you have solubilized penta in the water that's flowing off these poles, but you also have Particulates. You have chunks of penta that come off, and then it's like crystallized form. Um, and then you have pieces of the pole itself that are suspended solids that are going straight into our water courses. Um, or they're building up in soils and sediments at the base of the poles. So, um, I think I mentioned that these poles lose about 50%, about up to 50% of their oils in the first 8 to 10 years. Um, it, it's a, when you multiply that by 140 million poles across the United States, you can see the magnitude of the problem. Um, the Ecological Rights Foundation hired consulting engineers and geologists to collect <coughs> water and sediment samples. I'm sorry, I, I doubt that you can read the, the captions here on this map, but um, we started looking at poles around the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, this was a random pole. This is on a, an intertidal slough, uh, part of San Francisco Bay. Uh, this was in Marin County, California. Uh, here, samples of the soil taken at the base of uh, a penta-treated pole. You can tell that these poles are treated with penta. Each pole has a metal tag on it. The metal tag identifies the manufacturer of the pole, the type of chemical that they use, and sometimes has a date as well when it was treated. Um, the levels of dioxin at the base of this pole in the soil were uh, up to 260 parts per billion. This is where this presentation is going to get a little tricky. Dioxin is so toxic, as Patty was talking about, that it's measured in the parts per trillion. Uh, oftentimes, the objectives, the water quality objectives, or the, the screening levels are set in the parts per trillion or even the parts per quadrillion. That's a reflection of its toxicity. 
part per trillion is the equivalent of one drop of water in the volume of 20 Olympic sized swimming pools. Give it some perspective. Um, but to give a comparison of this level, so here we found 260 parts per billion. I compared it to a, a pretty famous Superfund site or infamous Superfund site in the San Francisco Bay Area. This is the McCormick and Baxter facility. It was a wood treatment facility. It's located in Stockton uh, on a slough called the Old Mormon Slough. It was uh, listed on the national priorities list in the early 90s, I believe. Um, it has been under investigation since the 1970s when they noticed uh, major fish kills in the Old Mormon Slough where there were discharges of penta from this facility. The EPA has required multiple phases of investigation and cleanup. Um, and I got this chart out of the record of decision in that Superfund um, file. Uh, here in this, at this facility, they have removed a tremendous amount of contaminated soils. They've installed 70 groundwater monitoring wells. They've put up fences to prevent the public from gaining access to the site and becoming you know, exposed to any of the contaminated soils that are still left. Um, here at this major Superfund facility, the maximum dioxin concentration in the soil at the most contaminated part of that facility was 143 parts per billion. So going back to our poll in, our random poll in Marin County where we have 260 parts per billion, just at the base of the utility pole. Um, another point um, of reference for this would be the um, California human health screening levels for soil. Uh, and there, you're looking at, I think it's 0 0.005 parts per billion. So many, many orders of magnitude greater than any relevant screening level uh, based on human health, um, much greater than the ecological screening levels as well. And so basically each of these 140 million poles across the country, at least the ones treated with Penta, are like miniature Superfund sites. They're located in people's backyards, they're in the front yards, they're in next to water courses, they're actually in wetland areas. Um, they're by playgrounds, bus stops, schoolyards. Um, I actually, let's see, oh, one other relevant figure from that EPA Superfund site, the McCormick and Baxter site. Um, again, we have 260 parts per billion at the base of the pole here. The cleanup goal that they ended up with at the McCormick and Baxter site was one part per billion. And that's because it was an industrial facility. And that's because it was an industrial facility. If it was a resident, they had done with a residential cleanup goal, it would have been much lower. And in fact, the, the industrial cleanup goals have gotten much lower um, since then because they've been reevaluated based on more recent toxicological data from dioxin. Um, let me go back to Marin County for a second. I just want to mention we also took water samples from a curb uh, inlet that was next to this pole. It had a concentration of 110 picograms per liter of dioxin. Um, picogram per liter is part per quadrillion. It's, you know, we're, we're talking about a lot of zeros here, 15 zeros. Um, for comparison, the um, California and EPA water quality objectives for dioxin, 0 0.014 picograms per liter. So here we have 110, it's nearly 8,000 times the water quality objective. That's just water running off a pole into a tropic. Which is 100 yards from San Francisco Bay, trains straight into the bay. And the toxicity of dioxin, you're talking about a, a water quality objective that is 0 0.014 parts per quadrillion. Yeah, which is 14 parts per quadrillion. Per quintillion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Say that one again. <laughs> uh, here's some results from um, some other polls that we sampled, this time in Contra Costa County. Uh, here, we had our consultants devise a way to collect water that was dripping off of a pole. 
there was just a, pole, a splintered piece of the pole was sticking out of the pole, and, the, and during storm events, you could see water flowing down the pole and dripping off of the splinter. Uh, we collected that water and um, had it analyzed. The drip sample off of that pole was 1,383 picograms per liter. Um, pole located, these poles were located in a drainage ditch that goes right into Nancy Boyd Creek um, and Alhambra Creek, tributaries of San Francisco Bay. Uh, the, the water that falls off these poles gets mixed in with other storm water in a drainage ditch that then runs through culverts into these creeks. We sampled at those culverts. Um, there were two culverts that we sampled. Uh, one on, I think, one on each side of this drainage ditch. Uh, one was 8.5 picograms per liter, the other was 28 picograms per liter. Uh, we've taken upstream samples and found non-detectable levels of dioxins, so we can pinpoint the sources. Uh, it does show that there's some dilution factor going on, uh, but still talking about orders of magnitude over water quality objectives here. This sampling was done during a full-blown Pacific storm where it rained like two and a half to three inches in 24 hours. So when you think about what the dilution factor was, and this was the, the East Pole culvert and the West Pole culvert were taken, the sample jar was held at the outfall of the culvert as it was falling into the creek. And it was the penta, the, the dioxin was still that high in spite of all of that dilution. Um, the Ecological Rights Foundation has sued Pacific Gas and Electric in one, uh, a couple of different cases. One of the cases relates to 31 storage and maintenance facilities that they have that ring San Francisco Bay. They're all within the San Francisco Bay drainage. Um, there's been a lot of uh, wrangling in that suit, motions to dismiss. We've made it over the initial hurdles. PG&E fought tooth and nail to keep us from getting onto this their sites to do stormwater and sediment sampling. Um, but we brought the matter to a magistrate judge who is in charge of discovery, and he allowed us to do the four site inspections that we were requesting. So we've, con we've conducted two of the four site wet weather site inspections at these facilities, one in Oakland, which is right on the bay, and another in Hayward, which is fairly close to the shoreline as well. Um, we've been getting our sampling results back uh, from those visits, and I'll talk about Oakland a little bit. The, the site in Oakland is pretty close to the uh, Oakland Airport. It is located just 30 feet, the border of the, of the property is about 30 feet, 40 feet from the shoreline. The facility has its own storm drain system. It's not plugged into the city's storm drain system but it has a system of drop inlets, and all the stormwater that falls on that 20 to 30 acre facility goes through their storm drain system and goes into a culvert straight into San Francisco Bay. The culvert is, some, is almost a, a little bit submerged in the bay, so in fact there's actually some mixing of salt water in that pipe, but during low tides, it's just stormwater flowing from the site directly into the bay. So we collected a number of samples. We went on the site, and as you can see here, uh, at these facilities, this is actually the Hayward facility, but at these facilities, PG&E stores a lot of freshly treated utility poles. Um, these poles are manufactured by a company called McFarland Cascade. They're pentatreated poles, um, and this entire area of the facility had a sheen over it. Uh, you can see a drainage ditch that runs along the side of this, um, there's water that pools up underneath these poles, they, they collect it, and you can actually see the pencil running off of them. In Oakland, there, um, there was a fairly good amount of water that had built up underneath one of these stacks of poles. We took a sample of it as a surface water sample. Um, it had a dioxin value of 930 picograms per liter. Uh, we took a sample of water out of one of their storm drains. They have these vaulted storm, vaulted storm drain drop inlets, and um, 
in that sample, there was uh, 100 and about 150 picograms per liter. Uh, we also took a sample directly at the outfall during a low tide, uh, sampling for a specific conductance to make sure that this was actually stormwater that was coming off of this facility. And the dioxin uh, level in that sample of water that was pouring directly into San Francisco Bay was 119 picograms per liter. So keeping in mind the EPA and California Toxics Rule water quality objective of 0 0.014 picograms per liter, we're talking about a dioxin level that's 8,500 times the water quality objective going straight into San Francisco Bay. This is just one of their 31 facilities. Um, and uh, an interesting note on that is there, there was litigation, a lot of wrangling over effluent limitations for refineries in San Francisco Bay. Um, the Chevron refinery in San Francisco Bay has an effluent limitation of 0.1 parts per billion, picograms per billion. The reason why it's 0.1 and not 0.01 is because the regional board allowed them a tenfold dilution factor. Uh, but still, they're, they're, Chevron cannot discharge more than 0.1, here we have PG&E at this particular facility discharging 120 picograms per liter. PG&E has no Clean Water Act permits for these facilities. They have claimed exemption. Wow. On what basis? They claim that their primary business purpose is the distribution of gas and electricity, that these facilities just support that primary purpose. And therefore, they are not industrial activities. Wow. The, but we just recently won um, a motion to dismiss. We beat back a motion to dismiss on that ground. The judge said, no, these are separate facilities. If these particular facilities, even though they service your greater goal, uh, our, if there are industrial activities occurring at these facilities, then they may need separate permits. So at these facilities, not only do you have pole storage, but you have recycling of metals. You have recycling of old poles or areas where they bring in the poles that you know are either being replaced deliberately or you know there's a car accident and the pole snaps off. All that stuff comes to these facilities. Um, old transformers are recycled there. They have they maintain their fleet of vehicles at these places. So they are huge industrial facilities. Uh, we also took samples of sediments at these sites. Um, in the Oakland, at the Oakland facility, we took uh, two sediment samples. They had uh, TEQs of 3,000 picograms per gram as parts per trillion, or 3.14 parts per billion. Uh, the other one, another sediment sample, had a level of 5,172 picograms per gram. That's um, 5.2 parts per billion. For relevance there, you would look at sediment quality guidelines. The sediment quality levels are adopted by NOAA, and the relevant one for dioxin um, in a marine environment here would be what's called the PEL, it's the probable effects level. Meaning at levels of, above, at or above the PEL, you are more likely than not to see adverse toxicological impacts to benthic organisms. And then, of course, you have the whole bioaccumulation and biomagnification of these chemicals up the food chain with additional effects. Uh, the PEL for dioxin is 0 0.02. We have parts per billion. Parts per billion. So um, the level that we're finding here, 5.2 parts per billion in the sediments, coming off of these facilities 260 times the probable effects level. Let's see. Uh, I just put this in here as an example. I don't know how clear this photo is from out there, but these sites are just littered with wood waste from the poles. As they move them around, they splinter off. When they recycle these poles and they bring them up and they pile up the used poles and, and piles in the back of the yard or throw them into um, roll-off containers, the stuff splinters all over the place. 
this just shows you, I mean, you can actually see the pent-up lead in this splinter. Mm -hmm. And um, also, while we were on one of these facilities, we did a wipe sample um, using a protocol developed by the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, the NIOSH 9100 protocol, where you take a, a certain area uh, of the surface that you want to test and you use what's called a ghost wipe, which is basically a, you know, a laboratory grade clean gauze pad. You wipe the sample, you fold it, then you wipe it again. And it gives you an indication of the amount of the particular chemical that is available for exposure should someone come into contact with it. Um, the wipe sample came back with just hair raising levels of dioxin, um, not surprisingly. It was um, 8,000 picograms of dioxin that came off on the wipe. So again, anytime anyone comes into contact with one of these poles, you're going to get the penta oil, the dioxin, all over your hands. But not um, children. But because children you, don't yeah, play in your poles. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Uh, we put this slide up there as an example. I don't know if you can see this, but some of the older flyers on this pole are soaked with penta oil. Right. Um, Has anyone done a study of the linemen who are working on these poles all day and touching them? I have seen studies of increased cancer rates with linemen, yes. Um, but I, I can't cite them off the top of my head, but yes, there are some studies out there. Well, that, that's some of the information that pg e is trying very hard not to let us take a look at. Is their union doing anything to go public with this knowledge or do anything about their exposure rates? I haven't seen anything. Um, so this is just a, an example of, of the exposures you're exposed by, you know, when you come into contact with soils, with sediments, when you're eating anything that's in the food chain where these discharges are occurring. Um, certainly, anytime you contact the pole itself, you're being exposed to very high levels of dioxin. And that gets us to Bill talk a little bit about the causes of action. Okay, so um, about 12 years ago, and we first uh, thought about using, because it was in California, we thought about using um, Proposition 65's um, discharge into drinking water and, and community right to know. Uh, provisions, uh, but it just became uh, it, it, it became really ungovernable because a lot of it has to do with it's being dis discharged into drinking water, and a lot of the science of showing, actually establishing that a kid touches a pole so that you can demonstrate an, an exposure that actually happened made it very difficult. And so finally, what we came up with um, the 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 the, the pg e yard facility cases that um, that Fred was describing, those are the easier I notion because it more traditionally fits into, you have an industrial facility where you have a point source and you have water running off of it and stuff falls falls down. Um, that was not, that was not really what, what we were trying to figure out, what we were trying to figure out was how to do a case involving um, the poles that are in people's backyards, that are in front of the daycare centers, that are in neighborhoods, in every neighborhood in the country, basically. And uh, what we came up with was um, the uh, Resource Conservation and Recovery Act has a, uh, at uh, 42 U.S.C. section 6972A1B, uh, it allows an action against anyone who is a past or present generator, transporter, or owner, or operator of a treatment facility who is contributing to the disposal of so solid or hazardous waste which may present an imminent and substantial endangerment to the human health and the environment. Now, there are some key words. There are people in this room who know more about this than I do, so bear with me. But um, the key words here are um, generator. The question was, is PG&E a generator? Well, yes, PG&E is a generator because a generator is someone who uses the product that then becomes the waste. And that includes both the utilities like PG&E and the companies that manufacture and sell the poles. Um, the other, another key word is may present, and the, in that is the word may. Because you don't have to show that 
somebody has actually been harmed, all you have to do is show that there may be harm. That um, there's a substantial possibility of harm in the reasonably near future. And then uh, the final key word, and this is the one that a lot of it turns on, is the word solid waste. Is it a solid waste? And the question of whether what comes out of that poll, that's what you have to think about. What we're trying to, what, what we're dealing with here is a poll that's in a residential neighborhood that has this, this where you have this oil and pentachlorophenol mixture that's been pressed into the pole, and then this stuff comes out of the pole, and runs down the pole, and you know across the sidewalk, down into the curb, and then into the into the bay. Um, that's that's the thing. You, that stuff that's coming out and going away. You have to try to fit that into the definition of what a solid waste is, and what a solid waste is. RICRA is a very interesting statute because it, it actually, you can, it, if you read its definitions of what a hazardous waste is, it gives you a, a very clear portrait of how corrupt our politics are. You know, uh, pentachlorophenol formulations that are uh, spill, spillage or drippage from unused formulations, except those at certain facilities in Midland, Texas, or you know, in some other influ influential congressman's district. Um, then they're not. And um, so what, is, what a solid waste is, is it, it's the, there's a little bit of an Alice in Wonderland um, aspect to it. Um, the action is for disposal of solid waste, but something is not a solid waste unless it's been disposed. So what we have is, the first place to start is at 40 CFR, <coughs> section 261.2, 2A1 which defines solid waste as a discarded material. And then you go to 40 CFR section 261.2 A2 little i, which defines discarded material as any material that is abandoned. Which then takes you to 40 CFR section 261.2 B1, which defines abandoned to mean disposed of. <laughs> and then it gets you to both 40 CFR section 260.10 and 42 CFR section 6903 yes. 3, which defines disposal as including discharge, deposit, spilling, leaking, placing of any solid waste um, where it will uh, enter into the environment, uh, including uh, uh, being discharged into any water. And the reason that you have two provisions there is because um, 69033 is actually part of CERCLA, the Comprehensive Environmental Response and Civil Liability Act, which borrows its definition of um, disposal from the RICRA definition, which is at 40 C5. So, um, and, and that's important because when you're trying to look at whether you can show that what comes out of these poles is a hazard, is, is a solid waste. A lot of the cases um, actually are circle cases, and they're looking at what has been, um, whether something has been disposed of uh, within the circle context, and it's a complicated wrinkle explaining it to the court that, yes, it's a circle case, but they're really defining it, uh, a RICRA uh, definition. So once again, it isn't a solid waste unless it's disposed of, but you're not disposing of it unless it is a solid waste. Um, this may sound silly, but the wordplay here is critical, and, it, and cases really hinge on which words you apply. Um, so what you have, once again, is the pole and the chemicals that are forced into it. And inside the wood, while they're inside the wood, they're actually being used because they have a function, they are preventing the wood from rotting. They're killing mainly fungus, which is, a, which is one of the main uh, rot uh, organisms for wood. Uh, but then the chemicals leak out of the pole, and they run down the pole, and they go into the soil. Uh, so when you frame your complaint, or when you are fighting a motion to dismiss, and we have found this by uh, painful uh, trial and error, um, 
when you're presenting your case to the court, you want to be very careful of the verbs that you use to describe that process. And so you look back to this, this definition. Um, the chemicals that are coming out of that pole, they discharge from the pole. They leak from the pole. They spill from the pole. Um, they don't ooze or run or drip from the pole. Um, and so it's, it's kind of important that you use the right words. Uh, because um, that's just the way things are. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it, which gets to a key, another key distinction is whether something is used or whether it is not used, which gets us to probably the leading case um, on defining uh, whether something is a solid waste. It's called Zans v. Nelson. Um, this was uh, a leaking underground gasoline storage tank case, and you would think that there would be lots of these, um, given how many leaking underground storage tanks there are, but there are not very many published decisions involving leaking underground storage tanks. So the way you want to think of a telephone pole that's in your yard or in front of your kid's daycare center is think of it as a tank holding these chemicals. It's a vertical tank that's up there, and the tank is leaking. It's leaking these chemicals out of this tank, and it's, it's, it really isn't that different from uh, a leaking underground storage tank. It just happens to be above ground. And what the Zans court found was that the critical distinction that makes something a solid waste is, well, it was leaking, of course. But in the process of leaking, it was transformed from a usable product, one that somebody was intending to use, into something that is no longer usable. And it's the fact that it's no longer usable that makes it then uh, solid waste that has been disposed of. And um, that's what gets you there. Because that, unless you can show that it is solid waste, you don't get within the ambit of RICRA. And getting within the ambit of RICRA, then that's, that really is the whole game with the telephone poles. Because um, once you're within the ambit of RICRA, it, uh, the rest of it, as Fred and Patty explained, showing imminent and substantial endangerment is not going to be that difficult. So, um, the, um, what's important is describing that movement of the chemical as leaking, spilling, or discharging. Um, there, is a, uh, uh, there is a case out there that I should alert you to. It's called Carson Harbor v. Unical. Um, oops. Okay. It's called Carson Harbor v. Unical. It's a Ninth Circuit. It's a, about a 2001 case. It's a Ninth Circuit en banc opinion um, that it's amazing for the wordplay that the judges get into. They, they just love to um, go into the Oxford English Dictionary and, you know, debate whether something is a deposit or it's a leak or it's it's a discharge or a spill um, and they this this is the case that really shows you how important these words are and what it was was Unical bought this property that was already contaminated with this viscous coal tar substance that had spilled 40 years ago and it was sitting in the soil and people had a gripe with Unical and they wanted to try to force Unical to clean it up like we want to try to force uh, PG&E to change its behavior with regard to the poles. Um, and this stuff was in the soil, and it was moving a little bit in the soil, but it hadn't really moved very much. And so the Carson Harbor co Court got into uh, whether something that's in the soil and moving just a little bit, whether passive migration in the soil could actually count as a, um, as a discharge or a deposit or a leakage or a spill. And if so, then it was a then it was a solid waste under CERCLA, and they could be made to clean it up. But if not, then it was not, and they couldn't be made to clean it up. And the Carson Harbor Court found that because it was passively in the environment from the time that Unical took possession of it, and it was not moving very far or very fast, and Unical didn't do anything, and it hadn't escaped from any confinement vessel or anything, that it was not being disposed of because it was not being discharged, it was not leaking, it was not spilling. 
And people said, well, it's being deposited. And they said, well, if you use that definition of deposit, then anything is deposited. So, sorry, Andrew? Yeah, I was just going to say, if, if disposable terms on whether the product, if usefulness is kind of the, the thing that they're looking at, isn't any product that spills into dirt disposed of because it's not useful once it's in dirt? Or yeah. I, think that wrong. Well, I wouldn't make that argument. Yeah, the shell didn't do the disposal, right? It was already there. Okay, in the later example, but when um, this Zan's case, um, right. that, that they didn't come to the conclusion that... I mean, no, they did. did. They concluded that it was a waste. They concluded at Zan's, they concluded that it was a waste. So you always want to cite Zan's and you always want to distinguish Carson Harbor. But Carson Harbor is also very valuable because they have this extensive discussion and they cite all of the cases that were that had ever come up. And so it's a, it's a valuable resource for finding uh, relevant cases. Um, and then, um, and that a le little leaking of Penta from the pall is just part and parcel of how it's used. And Except so, they'll, they'll say oozing. Yeah, they'll say, they'll say that it's oozing out or that it's uh, ripping out. Um, and what they, what they employ is a sleight of hand. They, they try to act like they, their action, the only thing that they did was they put the pole out there. And so it's the pole that is at issue, and the pole is being used, and so it's not a waste. And they want to you know, ignore that uh, uh, leakage and spillage and uh, discharge that's behind the curtain. Um, and um, they make they try to make an ex a distinction between active and passive, and they try to argue that the only the only <coughs> kind of uh, material that should be considered brickra solid waste is something that was actively thrown away, and so instead of something that leaked out. But there's legislative history that showed that it had to do with leaking drums that were were buried underground and. Um, like I said, there's the Zans case um, and some of its progeny. And then finally, the, what they try to say, part of their it's being used um, argument, they cite these cases uh, 